Well, today is a great day. I'm so excited to have on the podcast with me, my friend, Dr. Jonathan Powers. You're going to find what he has to say incredibly interesting as he is developing this new hymnal. But before we get there, welcome to the podcast. Thanks to, to Phil Lager who helped me design the music. It's still kind of fresh and I, I really enjoy it. Um, you can find links to Phil's music in our podcast notes. Also, like that he did the intro music and the outro music. So that's a lot of fun for me. I want people to know this week, right now, you can go to my website and you can find a new resources come out. It, it actually comes out next week on July 4th, but it is a study called Contender. It's a short six week study on the book of Jude. And it walks through this very important book and the call that it gives us to be contenders for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, this little study is an online course. And if you sign up this week, like, so when this podcast comes out, there'll be some discounts available for you. So you can use it with your small group. There's like a, a small group price where you get five downloads. There's a church wide price that's more expensive and there's some other options there as well. I have some great content over four hours of material there, me walking through this book. I bring in a special guest um, at one point as well. So it's really, it's really uh, been a fun thing for me to develop this and I would love for you to participate in it. But this week is really important if you're interested in it. So go to andymillerthe3rd.com as andymillerii.com where you can find a link to this powerful book. Michael Green says that as long as there's people who think that theology has a right to outrun the faith once for all delivered to the saints, the book of Jude will remain uncomfortably and burningly relevant. And that's what I found. I, I was blown away by the applicability of the book of Jude. So I hope you'll check that out. Now onto my podcast with Jonathan Powers. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. We are in for a treat today. Something has come around that you probably didn't even know was coming. And I have my friend, Dr. Jonathan Powers from Asbury Theological Seminary here with me to talk about it. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So this. Jonathan and I go way back, yeah. back to when we both had uh, baggy jeans and were listening <laughs> to uh, ska music and uh, I don't know if you were, uh, jars of clay and that sort of thing. Yes. And Jonathan yes. was on the road to that in my mind, a part of an, <laughs> a band. <laughs> Let me embarrass you a little bit here. Or, uh, yeah, a sure. band at Asbury <laughs> University that I thought was the next jars of clay, I guess. So Jonathan, you come a long ways. Yeah. Wow. Goodness. Yeah. That was fun. Um, that's probably a good, good stylistic genre comparison there. Jars of clay to what we were doing that kind of acoustic folky aggressive, um, stuff, but CCM still. So yeah, it was, yeah. Baggy jeans and bleached hair. I had the bleached hair back then too. True. So, you know. True. Not anymore. It's, it's, it's interesting. Like, uh, what can happen in 20 years? So we go from being a, I'm just going to say a cutting edge Christian, <laughs> contemporary music sensation at Asbury University to being a worship professor and uh and now like ordained in the Anglican church and yes. um studying hymnology and here yep. we are to talk about a new hymnal you've had a quite a ride so why don't you outline just briefly a little bit of your story what what took you through on this path to get where you are and then I want to talk about this exciting new project you have Sure. Yeah. You know, growing up in the church, my dad is a Methodist pastor, United Methodist pastor, and uh, grew up in more traditional settings in Eastern Kentucky. That's my background is all Eastern Kentucky. And just loved being in church and singing, uh, grew up on hymns. Um, my youth pastor started teaching me how to play guitar in youth group so I could help him lead music at youth group. And then eventually I could help with um, stuff in church every once in a while, too. So that first got me interested in worship. And then at Asbury University I was doing the music scene, writing songs and touring on the road and different things. And then um, had a lot of chances to lead in chapel and hall prayers and yeah. different events, you know, retreats and things. I really got into that. I just loved um, assisting. Yeah, you're great in, at it. Oh, thank you. It, yeah. it's, it's been an honor. I mean, my youth pastor really, he, he, invested in me to say it's not just about the music how do you think about worship and and the whole of worship and i really appreciate that his name is drew mcneil is campus minister now at moorhead uh state university and drew is uh he invested in me so much in that that it never really left me even in college i was doing this more performative on the road mm -hmm. thing 
but my love was there in, you know, in the worship, the congregated worship. I didn't like yes. being up front and doing the performance side. I really liked the participatory stuff. Right. Um, and that, that kind of shepherding the congregation's participation. So I, um, I just knew that staying in a, in a band and doing the performance thing was not me. I didn't find satisfaction in it. I didn't hear, I didn't sense a calling towards it. It was great in college. Um, so I actually did missions work overseas in Uganda for some time. Yeah. And then came back and did um, youth ministry in North Carolina for a few years and didn't really do music while I was there. I didn't lead music and missed it. I, yeah, I, I really did. Um, coming uh, to seminary then after a few years in North Carolina, I came to seminary and got um, uh, got in touch with Lester Ruth, who was the yeah. professor of worship here. And he and I started meeting and I started studying worship more um, academically and started studying lyrical theology, specifically Charles Wesley. How does he embody Wesleyan theology in his song lyrics in not just a, a, a cognitive, um, intellectual kind of way, but even an emotive? How does he bring all this together in this really beautiful way? So I loved that. And Lester and I did a lot of study in that. And I thought I would go on and do a PhD in lyrical theology, lyrical theology of Charles Wesley, but I um, ended up studying some other things with worship and focused on Robert Weber instead. Um, but that's always been there. That's, I, I've always had that love for it and have done a lot of writing and just continual research on lyrical theology and how music plays into that. You know, how does music um, and lyric, how do these things work together? Yeah. Yeah. How do they uh, in worship and in um, this sung form of worship and prayer and um it, yeah, I mean, part of it started there with Lester in that academic way, um, but I have to say it, it was also ingrained in me growing up in the church and experiencing it and just loving um, that aspect of worship that it was kind of a weird thing in some ways to say, you know, I mean, you see it in like flash mobs culturally and maybe like a sing-along musical or something but people don't just get together to sing anymore. That's not what mm. we do, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's something beautiful about it at church to say, we get together and sing and we do it passionately, you know? Amen. Yeah. So I just love that. And I've loved studying it and saying, but it's not just about the, the passion. It's not just about the emotion. Uh, there's a theological aspect of it because it's for God. You know, this is, this is the congregation right. coming together, not for fun, but for God and to come before God. And so I, I've always been fascinated by that and to understand, well, what does that require of us then? So not just, well, let's sing whatever. What does it require of us? And so um, looking Let at- Let me stop how, there. Let me get- yeah. uh, So like in that, in that moment, there is something powerful that happens as we have ideas in our head, ideas that come from the great consensual tradition of the church, and then it informs like a theology. And it, th these are the most- important metaphysical concepts that exist right yeah. so they're they're there they're on a page and, and they're on a screen or on a wall whatever it is and yeah. then all of a sudden like it then enters into a different mystery right like you have yeah. a whole nother mystery of music which I, I, I haven't i haven't thought about this enough but like is in itself to me a, almost a proof for the existence of god here you have this blend yeah. of pitch in time and then you throw in all the dynamics of like what happens when people commute like you communally sing yeah. it's like you have all those things happening together it it's not just a motive like this is a, a singing congregationally is a theological act it i is. love i love what it what it does for us so i th i think it's i like how you're you, you're identifying there's something that you know you are part of that you experience but now it's more fully being thought through and you're like okay what is that and investigating it yeah, it's such a beautiful image of the church if you think of it as many bodies but one sound, right? Mm. Like when you hear something, you can hear many things. I mean, that's like the Trinity. That's what Je Jeremy Begbie says. You know, music helps us understand. Yeah, the the Jeremy Begbie is a Cambridge, uh, a, a Cambridge trained of uh, yes musician and, and uh, theologian. theologian. Yeah. And so, if you haven't found that name, it's spelled like those of my people, my audience in the Salvation Army, the early um, biographer of William Booth, Begbie, B E G. Oh. B I E. I always have wondered if they're related, but so, That's a good but question. yeah, I yeah. See, I know you, you and I know Jeremy Begbie. Yeah. I want to make sure people maybe can find his name too. Keep going, Jonathan. Yeah. Sorry no, no, that's great. Yeah. But I love that theological aspect of music that um, many 
voices contribute, many, many sounds come together. So you have distinction, like you would say in the persons of the Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you also have a unity because you only Amen. hear one thing, you know? Um, and so also just the body of Christ to think of it as the body of Christ, many members, but one body, it's hard for us to visualize that physically. Right. Um, I mean, you can get there with like, uh, what was the, the power Rangers, the thing, the thing <laughs> that comes together and all these, parts. but I still don't get it because you still have these. It, it's, I think Jonathan, you're betraying our generation. Okay. I, that back is up, true. Back up because power Rangers was not our generation. Voltron we go back to our, Voltron. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get this straight. So Let's have true. our priorities straight. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> yeah. But Voltron was the same concept, but for whatever reason, didn't take off like the eight versions of power Rangers. Okay. That is so true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I think about that, like the, the visual images don't quite, or a puzzle, piece, you know, you have all the pieces, they come together into one picture. That kind of gets there, but music just has a different way of doing that, that like you're immersed in it, you're surrounded by it. It, it, it brings you into something so much larger than yourself. And it's just beautiful how all that comes together. And so I think of that, and I also think of, you know, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, it's fascinating in the worlds that they create. So you take C.S. Lewis, his you know most popular world is Narnia right. and J.R. Tolkien, his most popular world is Middle Earth. And both of them, when they talk about the creation narratives, things right. are sung into being. Amen. You no, know, yeah. like it's music that's doing it. So there's a singing into the creation that has a singing as, and so there's, there's, there's this, um, the, the singing and the song aspect of it. That's what I was trying to say. The song aspect of it. And there's this sense that, um, I've, I, and I, you know, I, I don't have scriptural proof or anything like this to, to back it up, but where some theologians have said they, they believe when God speaks, it comes out as song, like we would hear it as song. Um, and because it's such a creative, expressive um, way of, of communicating, and um, there's something so mysterious and beautiful and participatory about music that draws us into it to say like what if god's voice when we actually hear it in its purest form is more musical than what we think in terms of spoken like this you know when you're, you're talking about even your own vocational direction here and this is a bit of a sidebar but maybe somebody just needs to hear these type of vocational mm -hmm. pieces too that you and i experienced i had a similar feeling being a um, music major at at Asbury University and as a composition major, I just, I loved, I mean, I, I love studying music and mm. I still love experiencing and writing to a certain extent, but not like I used to, but what I found it, it, like similar to you, like, wait, uh, you had, a, you guys, it was a, a, a successful band and it could mm. have like probably gone on to other things and, sure. and did to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, I, I, as a composer, I had some success, but I found that, I, I kind of hit a, uh, a high point. Like I had a piece that won the Kentucky music educators. Contest, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And right. so it was a big moment for me. And I realized as excited as I was to present that piece, I was most excited about telling people about it. Oh yeah. And I kept on finding that if my own music on my own music making, I liked telling people about the message of that I was trying yeah. to convey more than the, the music. And that kind of like led me to say, all right, what is it that I like the best here? And I, I like that yeah. about your own call. Like here you are in this performative function, but what you realized while you're doing that was what you liked was escorting this, this yeah. communal act yeah. and leading people into this mystery and that helps hopefully points them to something else, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I always say, I, I use the image of a telescope a lot of times when I'm teaching this to say, you know, it's not the music itself is not supposed to be looked at or admired. I mean, it's a, it can be a beautiful thing and we can say, wow, that's wonderful. This is great music. But like a telescope, it's meant to be looked through to bring Amen. the image into a better view. We can see more of that image. We can see um, the details of it, the characteristics in a better and clearer way. Um, if it's just the music that we're focusing on, it's like taking a telescope and saying, like, how, how beautiful this telescope is and all the features and all this. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Wonderfully crafted telescope. That's not the purpose of the telescope. Mm, mm -hmm. um, so I think of that with music. Say, yes, you can say that is a beautiful melody and listen to the way those violins come in or the way that this voice, how great that voice is. But if we get caught up in that, we're, we're focused on the lesser thing, um, mm -hmm. the thing that's meant to be useful to bring us into something greater. And so I think of um, 
music serving that same purpose as a telescope, if we're not actually looking through it to see the moon or to see Jupiter in a more clearer way, then we're not actually using the telescope properly. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so I, I want to make sure to get to talk about this hymnal, but we might yeah. take a few other, I want to go yeah. back to a few of those other points too. Um, but here we are, You, and I, I was invited and joined you on a committee mm -hmm. to think about a new Pan Wesleyan hymnal and the idea like that I pan Wesleyan, meaning it kind of goes across the various traditions, you know, kind of of the children and grandchildren denominationally of John Wesley. So I was kind of like there, I'm representing the Salvation Army, Free Methodist, Nazarene, AME, AME Z, United Methodist, and keep on going down, down the list. Like yeah. we had a bunch of people come together to put together this hymnal. Now, before we talk about like what got in that hymnal and how we got there, why a hymnal? This is my question. Like, why do we need it? Like, does anybody even use a hymnal, Jonathan? Like, why should we even be thinking about printing a hymnal? That's a fantastic question. You know, that's and that's a big question today. Are hymnals relevant? Are hymnals worth looking into as the age of the hymnal died? I don't think it has, um, you know, for the same reason that I mean, different reasons. I think there's similarities. I'm not trying to equate them. But the same reason we wouldn't say a, a print Bible, a hard copy Bible is right. um, a thing of the past. You know, we say, no, it's actually important. Um, and we're not drawing those similarities to say, you know, the, the Bible, when we see the Bible, we have a tangible, uh, a tangible uh, I, I thing. Something that's you know. tangible. <laughs> yeah, something that's tangible. I didn't want to say like artifact or relic, and that sounds too, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like to call yeah. the Bible that. But yeah, it's something to say, like, this is what we believe. You can look at it and say, in here, this is what I believe. This is what the church is founded on. This is right. what has been handed down to us. Um, now, of course, the Bible is a closed canon and a, hymn, a hymnal can be an open or a changing canon. Um, but at least you can say at this time, this place and time. So that might actually be more of an artifact or a relic, a hymnal right. would be. At this point in time, for those of us in the Wesleyan tradition, this embodies who we are, what we believe. This embodies our song. So there's an identity that's there, right? We can say in the hymnal, it carries an identity mm -hmm. where digital, it, it, that can get lost. Or yes. how do you have a canon? I mean, to use that word canon, you know, a, a, a select set group of uh, songs or, you know, we'd say books of the Bible for the, for the Bible, but for the hymnal to say these songs, we have carefully selected and chosen these like, cause it's limited. We can't put everything in there. These are ones that have been very carefully selected and chosen to say, there's an identity embedded in them about who we are about this tradition that we've come th from the theology that's been handed down and how we worship God, who we believe God is not just about yes. who we are, who we believe God is and the ways that we pray to God and the ways that we sing about God. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a canon there. Um, there's, a, you know, part of the, the hymnal as well is uh, it, it, um, it literally allows us to be on the same page when we're singing. You know? yeah. One of the things that happens with digital media and um, uh, kind of, not having music and reading music is you get all kinds of iterations, even with hymns that happens, but you can at least take a hymnal and say like, this is how we're singing it. And not that we have to right. be rigid with it, but at least say we can be on the same page. You can look at it. You can know it. Um, the words, you know, there might be six versions of yeah. come thou fount, but this is the version we're using because of the theology. It says, you know, but we're literally on the same page here. Like uh, you so have your own important. preferences that come too. So, um, Hey, if you ever been someplace, there's uh, often people will if they sing for before a meal, you might sing mm. something. Be present at our table, Lord. Right? Yeah. And generally agreed upon those words. Uh, people in the Methodist, more kind of like Methodist traditions, might call it a Wesley prayer or something. I'm not sure right. he actually said it, but then nevertheless, like in the Salvation Army regions in my denomination, the Salvation Army would sing different endings or have a few different words. Oh, and so. Um, uh, may strengthen for thy service be, or live to fight and die for thee, or yeah. live in feast and fellowship for thee. I mean, all kinds of different words that come in. But you, so there's always a little kind of a joke when you yeah. get together with other people, like how you're going to finish that prayer. But the idea here, a hymnal, like, okay, we're on the same page. Like this, this yeah. is how we're going to do this. There are different versions, different ways to think about these songs, but we're going to do it this way. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly right. I mean, it's saying that we really believe in 
not that other versions are bad, but we believe in passing down a specific theology and doctrine and passing down ways that we do sing songs. And, you know, again, not to say like this version is wrong or bad. We just, we had to select one yes, and we yes. had to spend the time deciding which one and why. And that, most people might not ever know that, but we had a reason for it as an editorial team. And then to say, this is what we want people to carry forward. And there's that part of it too, that, um, is important to a hymnal is a good uh, catechetical resource, just a teaching, a discipleship resource. Yes. Um, so it can be a good devotion book. Uh, you can work through it. It's laid out in a very intentional way. Um, you can see all the lyrics there um, at once and, and work through them and read through them. Uh, it, it's, it's a good thing to hand down and say, again, say, here's our doctrine, our theology, things that were very specifically chosen to teach us about the triune God, to teach us about right. the church. Yeah, it teaches about our interaction in the world as the church. Um, it, so uh, the canonical structure yeah. of uh, the interstructure is important too. Like uh, yeah. if you were to look at uh, various hymnals from your denominations, whatever it is, you'll see kind of an emphasis that comes of like what matters to that denomination. So in mine, yeah. which emphasizes warfare quite a bit, and, and, and in that sense, not in the sense of like um, just like spiritual warfare, praying out demons, which – I affirm, by the way, sure. but it's more or less, um, you know, fighting for the gospel, getting people saved. Um, more than half of the older songbooks would be fight, uh, like the fight. There might be a section called the fight or the war, the war, yeah. as opposed to starting, say, um, with a doctrine of God or revelation yeah. or salvation. So what's the structure of this, of this hymnal? Like what, how did you yeah, lay it out? So that's a good question. And this is really unique to this hymnal. Um, as, as far as we know, we've not seen another hymnal that has done this as we've done a little bit of research. Um, and of course, there's so many out there by so many traditions could easily have missed something. But as far as we know, the major Wesleyan hymnals, at least, that are out there um, have different structures where they'll start with usually the character God, the love of God, or uh, the something about, you know, God's nature, um, the triune God. But what we decided to do is to lay ours out according to the articles of the Apostles' Creed. Oh, interesting. So if, if you think through the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty. You know, So that's the very first article. And the first one's, it, it's the character of God, and it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is the Trinity. So, um, so you have things like that, like holy, 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 um, things like that, that would be in that section uh, because it's it's it, it is kind of kicking off the creed too, but um, then you have Creator of heaven and earth. You know the next line, and so God the Father Almighty, and then Creator of heaven and earth. That's where you'd get like this is my Father's world, all okay. creatures of our God and King, um, yeah. and you get and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, and so some general Christological hymns. Right, and then who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Um, we would look at Advent and, you know, and not just Ad, like the coming of Christ, the promised coming of Christ, songs right. that talk about that. So, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. Um, and then he was born of the Virgin Mary. So you get Christmas songs there and you okay. know, birth narrative. And that's one of the neat things with hymns is you get narrative so many times, yes. as well as theological topics and prayers and things. So a lot of times hymns are telling stories or they enter into the story in certain ways. Not that other songs don't, but just saying, right, right. you know, hymns do um, do that. And so, yeah, so we, we laid it out in that way. Um, so you get into the crucifixion, you know, uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. Um you can you can get into um, the passion narrative, right? Uh, right. Those hymns, um, and you know, songs that talk about the cross. Um, but I mean, what else? Where that takes us though is um, he ascended into heaven, right? And you're I, like, oh, wait a second, that's part of the story. It doesn't end with the resurrection. Yeah. You know, actually, there's an ascension to heaven. So you get one of my absolute favorite hymns before the throne of God above. Like, where's Christ now and what is he doing? Well, before Amen. the throne of God above is talking about that. Um, or some of Charles Wesley's, you know, Low he comes on clouds ascend, descend. Yeah. 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 Um, some fantastic hymns that really talk about the ascension. So, you know, we, we put some in there for that because they're in the Methodist hymnal and some other hymnals that we, we looked into. Um, so the structure of it gave us a narrative 
um, but also theological points that we want yes. to make sure we hit. So we can hand it to somebody and say, look, this is going to teach you through the faith. Now, the creed is just a basic distillation of the faith. We're not saying the creed is the end all be all, you know, right, right. But say this is this is the basics of the faith. And so you can look at this and you can learn about God, God's character, God's nature, God's actions, um, God's relationship with humanity and with the world. And you can walk through the story of Jesus Christ and of the church through all yes. this. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. You no, know, it's like, wow. And it, it was such an interesting organizational concept to say, wow, yeah, like let's find some good hymns that talk about the forgiveness of sins or we already have them. So like, how do we organize? Like, and some that could fit different places, of course, but say, well, we want to really bolster this section to help people understand what do we mean by the church? The the church is one foundation. You know, let's put that, I believe in the Holy Catholic church or the universal church, you know, right, right. church is one foundation. Let's put that in there. Um, yeah. Or um, onward Christian soldiers, you know, something like that to say, this is about the church and who the church is and what the church is doing. So I love it. Yeah. So it's interesting, like uh, thinking about the Methodist movement and our friend, uh, Ryan Danker, that we, you know, run the John Wesley Institute in Washington, yeah. D.C., has recently written an article about the messiness of Methodism and mm. how uh, Methodism in itself, and that's like all the traditions kind of come from that movement, is is confused. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a problem, it's a problem, but the, the ecclesiology and how we function mm. as, a, as denominations has been challenged because Methodism itself started as a renewal movement mm. to the Church of England, of the Church of England, and rather not like John Wesley really parted with it, particularly in England before coming to the United States. And then there's various branches. And but yet there's like there is this cohesive center. I think that that's what's exciting about this is that you made an effort to connect and not just you, mm. your team. Mm. I know Julie Tennant was a part of this. And mm. the I often say the other Andy Miller from, right. yeah. uh, <laughs> from Seedbed, one yeah. of the other Andy Millers, I say. Um, so bring this idea together of like having some, and there also is a function in that emerging Methodist denominations might need a hymnal. We can talk about that in a little bit sure. too, but talk about the denominations you tried to bring in and just that idea in, or, or movements as a whole yeah. in, in that process. Just talk to me about that. Yeah. So, I mean, it really was an effort to make it pan Wesleyan, as you said, like really embodying the Wesleyan um, denominations, Wesleyan traditions. Um, so, you know, I think you've mentioned a lot of these. There's United Methodist, Free Methodist, uh, the Wesleyan, the Nazarene, the Salvation Army, as well as, you know, the, the AME, the AME Zion, um, the CME, the Church of God, yeah. Uh, Church of God in Christ um, uh, and Church of God Anderson, um, both in Church of God Cleveland, actually, all, all three of those. Um, the I, I can't remember if I, the Christian Missionary Alliance, um, even like the, the United Brethren. And, and honestly, some of it, too, is to say, let's not neglect the Anglicans, not only because I am one, but, <laughs> because, you know. <laughs> Um, but to say, you know, the, the Wesleys were Anglican, that, that's, that was their home, at least, right. you know, it's, it's what they were raised in. And there are some really good Anglican hymns out there that, that would um, still fit within the vision of this. Um, to, to, so bring all of this together and say, what does this look like? So what we, what we really wanted to do is say, what are some of the distinctives of Wesleyan theology and so we would we would say you know what we believe about Christ's atoning work yeah. um, is a big part of this. So um, it's not a limited atonement, right? But we believe Christ died for all. Um, then the nature of grace, which relates to that, you know, that God pours His grace out freely, um, and then you know it's a matter of what what do we do with that grace that God has poured out. Um, so um, God is pouring out his grace freely. So how do we focus on, on grace? How do we focus on atonement in this um, that are part of those Wesleyan distinctives uh, that we share? Um, and a big part of it too is the work of the Holy Spirit and sanctification. We said we really want to have a robust section on ho the Holy Spirit's work and especially the Holy Spirit's work in sanctification. Awesome. I think, you know, that's the grand depositum of, um, of, of, the Methodist movement or of the Wesleyan faith, if we put it that way. 
but that sanctifying work of God in our lives to bring us to complete salvation, not just salvation in the here and or not in salvation in the future, um, but salvation to the fullest here and now as the Holy Spirit works in our lives and perfecting us and bringing yes. us to Christian perfection. So I said, we really want to focus on these things, say like all of us come from that heritage. And so there are so many good songs with that, as well as just good general songs that talk about who God is. We could say, you know, I'll go back to all creatures of our God and King. That's not necessarily like distinctly Wesleyan. Right, right. Um, because it was written well before West, the Wesleys were on the scene. It was written before the Anglican Church was on the scene. Um, but to say um, this is good theological material, it's it's a good resource of the church. How do we look at this treasury of resources throughout the history of the church and hold on to some of those while also looking at Wesleyan distinctives and hold on to those as well? So with kind of both hands hanging on to these two guardrails you know so that we can walk this path and this hymnal can be a way that we we help people walk it yeah so it's interesting like as you work through that this getting to these traditions which in, i would like to hear what you heard um from these various traditions and what you even discovered because i imagine like there are things that you didn't know now the, the there's been a few attempts at some of these things through the years i think of a camp meeting in hymnal I think mm -hmm. it's called On Higher Ground that Nazarene Press published. Oh, you might even have it back there. I think I have but, it back here. <laughs> so like, it's interesting. Like that's a good, a good, and I would often be surprised to go through there and find, oh, there's a couple of Savi Sharmi songs in here. Mm -hmm. And, and, but that, that's a short little thing that's um, meant it, it has a function. Be mm -hmm. around for camp meetings is like kind of multi, multi denomination, multiple denominations come together at a camp meeting. Um, but I would love to hear some of those ones that worked that you have added or some of the ones that people are insisting on. They might not know it as we say it, but maybe people, I imagine most of the denominations that you we've listed, I have listeners from there, but I know I have a good chunk of Savage Army people. So I'm going to tell them some of the ones that, uh, we, that made it in oh, yeah. on the Savage Army side. So I, uh, Caleb Loudon and I were the ones working on behalf of the Savage yeah. Army and we did a pretty good survey around uh, making sure that our folks felt represented. But of course, our number one, that we would, we would pull out the Salvation Army's interest if we didn't get O'Banless mm -hmm. Salvation in there. So don't worry, mm -hmm. that, that one made it, right? And we have um, uh, Bramwell Coles here at the cross. I'll mm -hmm. go in the strength of the Lord. Uh, several Albert Orsborne songs, um, In the Secret of Thy Presence, um, Christ is All. And we are able to get Bill Himes, All That I Am. Mm -hmm. uh, several gallons and Larson songs to be like Jesus. They shall come from the East. Um, we also had a got we're able to get Phil Leger. And I think um, it's nice to have somebody who's around our age, having a, um, a song or two included. I think I surrender is in there mm -hmm. and maybe oh, one other Phil Leger one, but anyways, those are, those are kind of like the Salvation Army contributions that I'm, I'm that have made it. What are some other ones that you were surprised by, or you, you were delighted to learn yeah. from other traditions? Well, if, if you're okay, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm going to take a step, just a side step for a moment oh, and share how we came up yes. with the core texts for this hymnal um, and then how we, how we kind of expanded from that. So what we did is we took, and I'm trying to remember how many hymnals it was. I can't remember off the top of my head, but we had like eight hymnals you know we, we took I'm, I'm probably going to miss something here so i'm giving more of an idea than the full truth <laughs> right here but we took the united methodist hymnal the most recent united methodist hymnal free methodist hymnal wesleyan hymnal nazarene hymnal salvation army songbook um ame zion ame cme um what am i missing um i'm missing something in there nazarene um, Nazarene. Yeah. yeah. So basically you, th you think of those major Wesleyan denominational movements, we took their most recent hymnal and then we indexed, we, we put on a spreadsheet, every single one of their indexes mm. um, on one huge spreadsheet. Yeah, and then what we it. did, yeah, I mean, gigantic. And then what we did from there was took, you know, we listed them alphabetically and then we saw what songs appear the most in these hymnals, right? So say you have eight hymnals. I don't know how many, I just, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but say you had eight hymnals that we were comparing. Are there any songs that appear in all eight? 
Wow. So, yeah. and can it be, um, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing, especially as Wesleyans, those two are in all eight, right? Yeah. yeah um, for sure. I'm trying to remember some of the others, holy, holy, holy. I mean, some of the standards that you'd think of, you know, and so we got a good core list of like a couple hundred hymns that way. I'm, I'm not a couple, I'm like 150 or something that way that like, they, these appear in all of them, you wow. know? Um, so those are must haves because those are favorites. Those are good hymns. They are, um, ones that have stood the test of time, you know, so we're, we're, we're going to keep those. And then we said, all right, what appears in seven, what appears in six, what appears in five. And we basically went to what I think up to five, you know, so if we're talking eight, how five and above, and we said anything like five or six, let's evaluate, um, if it's only five or six, um, if it's, I'm sorry, probably four or five, let's evaluate if it's five, six or seven, then we're going to automatically include it. Unless when we're going through the index, we just feel like, no, that one's just not anymore or whatever. But I don't think we struck any that were in like the good, like at least five, six or seven. Um, I'm sorry, six or seven. If it was an all eight, we kept it um, pretty much no matter what. Um, And then um, the ones that appeared, you know, five or, or four or under, you know, we just evaluate, we just put, we laid them all out and said, um, you know, if it's just one, then maybe it's so esoteric or something, you know, we just don't know, but unless somebody specific. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Unless somebody told us like, no, we really think this one needs to be in there, but to give a starting point, you know, we came up with, I don't, I don't, I, again, I don't know numbers, but let's just say after all of our indexing and everything, we ended at like 500 or 550 you know um yeah after all of that and we kind of narrowed them down and everything and then from there what we did is we got our consultants from so that was you and caleb and from all these different de- denominations we had anywhere from two to three consultants from each denomination and we sent them the index of what we had come up with by comparing all these indexes and kind of narrowing it down to here's the ones that we think are the most core when comparing all of these hymnals to each other, here's the core group. And then we said, is anything in this group that you don't think needs to be and just right. strike it, tell us, right. you know, I mean, you don't get to strike it, but you can advise us. It's an advisor, right, right. You know, advise us that we should strike that one and give us a reason why, or is there anything not in here yet that needs to be in there? And some of those could have been ones that we tossed out because we just didn't know. Like, we're not from that denomination. We don't know that that one's one that really should be claimed, you know? Um, so we got all of those back and we're able to put them in. And I think we had something like 150, um, somewhere between 120, 150 that came back to us. And I think we included almost every single one. There might have been two or three that we didn't. Right. And different reasons. For that. Sometimes it was like, well, we just can't find the music or there were one or two where we said, this is a great song, but the music is so stuck in like that yes. era or whatever. It's just not relatable or accessible. And so we found the different tune that would fit, you know, use the metrical index and found this meter right, matches that meter. So we can just use this more familiar right. tune with that hymn. Um, and hopefully more people would sing it, you know, because they'd see, oh, we know that tune. These are great words. Let's sing it. Um, if you have, uh, you talk about like getting down to the uh, ones, there would like where it was just in one hymnal. Uh, I, I'm guessing a lot of the Salvation Army ones were like that because, oh my uh, gosh. for instance, you wouldn't include Joy in the Salvation Army in the Pan Wesleyan hymnal. Yeah. And we have a lot of songs like that being the salvation soldier, uh, what your uniform looks like, all this sort of stuff. Uh, of course, you probably would. I, I don't know. Uh, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene. If you had to take oh, out their hymnal too. Yeah. Sorry, bad dad joke here. I can't. <laughs> fact. Right. Oh, the Nazarene. So you had to do song. those type of yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we did. I mean, you're exactly right. There were some of those and there were a couple, honestly, that, I mean, w- that we weeded out beforehand, even just theologically, we said, you know, maybe for that time, yeah. um, there was something to that, like in the understanding of theology and all that, but we actually don't like that doesn't match our theology. Um, and I'd say theology changes over time, but at that time they might've had um, some this things pushing them. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there were some of those things that, um, that we just said, you know, we can, we can toss those. Um, so, yeah, so, so we put those together and the beauty of that was having, 
consultants from the Salvation Army, like you and Caleb, was wonderful because there were songs we would have never known. You know, I mean, looking at it, there were songs that either we tossed or that just weren't in that hymnal that you all could be like, no, this is actually a good one. It didn't make this hymnal that you all looked at, but it's in previous ones and we shouldn't have lost it. Right. right. Um, there were songs that appeared in a couple of hymnals. Like I remember early on, I think it was a song like, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, which I love. I think it's a fantastic hymn. Right. And it didn't appear in very many hymnals, but I said, we got to keep that song because it's so good. Um, so we made some quick editorial decisions on our own, even early on. But hearing back from the consultants from different traditions was so helpful. Oh, no, this is a song we we just love and we sing all the time. We've got to keep. Um, but not just from certain. I mean, it, it kind of exp- it, 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 it's. It, it um, expanded across different styles and genres. We had camp meeting songs. Yes. You know, we had more traditional English hymns. Um, we had with the AME Zion and the AME church, we had um, some spirituals that were coming in, you know, more hymn like spirituals that were being suggested. And it was so beautiful to see all this come together and say, wow, these are wonderful songs. And we can pull all this together and say, look at who we are as Wesleyans across the you know, yes. this great span of traditions or not traditions, but of denominations that are still from the same heritage, you know, um, and the ways that we have this expression that can still be unified, but also maintain some distinction, but not without coherency. You know, we were able yeah. to still say like, okay, this one is great, but it starts to feel like it's a little bit too much on the edges, you know, in, in terms of that style or something, you know? Um, and so we can still acknowledge that, tradition and these hymns that were suggested and not feel bad about having to let go of that one particular song because it was a little bit too too far that would lose some coherency to what the hymnal is itself i love it i'm excited to see what comes from these other other denominations outside of my own i'm more familiar with the united methodist hymnal maybe because it's the largest uh Mm. you know wesleyan denomination seemingly and um so I know know that tradition fairly well, but I'm excited to see what will come in otherwise and how that can enrich the greater yeah, yeah. Pan Wesleyan movement. And I think the same thing, like I'm, I'm hopeful too, that people will look at Obama's Salvation or the other one that I didn't say earlier, Send the Fire. Like these oh, yeah. are songs that can really be powerful for the, uh, the greater Christian world. And sometimes in our own circles, sociologically, it's easier to kind of yeah. plant the hatches down. There is... Uh, fruit to share from yeah. from the whole community so i'm i'm excited about it, john i really appreciate your work and making it happen yeah well you know it, here's something that's kind of fascinating is the oldest song in there is from uh let me think at least the fourth century we've got oh uh, let all mortal flesh keep silence which is from okay. the liturgy of saint james um we've got another we got a couple from john of damascus that are in there translated of course into english um so if you're looking, well, oh, glad some light. That one's actually okay. from like yeah, the sure. second century, you know. Um, so oh, glad some light is in there, um, and so um, you've got it like from the second century, and I think the newest one in there, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to think. We've got the blessing that I think came out in 2020. Um, Carrie Job and oh, um, yeah, it's the the Lord bless you and keep you make a yeah, station. Sure. All the like oh, awesome. YouTube videos came out with yeah. people singing during the pandemic, singing that song. Um, uh, what's the other one? Um, it's Phil Wickham. I can't believe I, I'm forgetting the name, but it's uh, Alleluia, praise the one who set me free. Alleluia, okay, yeah. death has lost. Um, he he had broken okay. every chain. Yeah, there's salvation in Living hope. I had to go through it. I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> I was thinking too. I'm not as fast. Yeah. But- so, yeah, so Living Hope, um, which I think was 2018 or 19, uh, maybe somewhere around there. So just to think like, yes, this is an when I say like it's an artifact, a historical artifact, that's like a here's who we are, you know, given the music that we have available to us. You know, we're, we're saying it's not just the stuff written in the last 50 years or the most popular stuff or the last couple hundred years. Um, we're saying we're going all the way back to the second century but also going back to just a couple years ago. And so there's a good number of what we would consider to be contemporary hymns in there. And even some that are hymn-esque, but might not be totally hymns. You know, a song like How Great Is Our God. You just can't deny that that's not been a very 
powerful and meaningful song in our world in the contemporary song, you know, one of the most right, popular right. contemporary songs and say, well, we want to include that one, even though it's, it's not a typical hymn structure of like verse, 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 or verse, refrain, verse, refrain, verse, refrain, you know, it's, um, it's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. But we said, you know, that's okay. We're going to still write it out like a hymn, put it in the okay. hymnal because we think it's important and it shows something about where we are, who we are. And um, uh, to also say it's not only, you know, a, hy uh, um, a hymnal does not have to be filled with things that are at least 50 years old or whatever. Right. You know, we can, um, although 50 years from now, they will be, you know, but for right. now. Um, There's something good about yeah. having things that are old. And to yes. be able to rest in the fact that like, okay, this has been sung by the church for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, uh, 2000 years, okay, 1800, 1900 years like that. There's something about that. Like this has definitely stood the test of time, yeah. but there also needs to be some of these things that represent our time, even though there, there's not exactly cutting edge. Now I'm curious yeah. about that just from a pragmatic standpoint, do those songs um, like using some of those more recent ones, do they have chord charts? Do you use like, function i mean you said you have it as a hymnal yeah. or, or is it printed in a different the same the same way or how'd you go about that yeah we we worked through that we talked through that and weren't sure exactly what we wanted to do at first and even considered would we put chords in just for those songs um or would we try to create an, a website you know and and try to do you know not just those songs but just start working through the hymns too and saying yeah, sure. look we want you to for those that lead with a band or guitar or whatever, we want you to be able to use this as well. Um, we're not still sure what we're going to do, maybe in terms of website or resources like that. We might eventually do something that's not like forefront for us right now. But um, we said for those, we're just going to leave them. As, we want them to look very uniform to everything. Okay. Um, there's things like CCLI that are out there, Song Select, um, those websites that you can go to and pull those chord charts right, off. Right, right. So said we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to put more work on ourselves. If somebody, you know, people are using those sites pretty well already. Um, so we'll just trust that that will keep happening. We might put together our own resource eventually for this hymnal, like I said, to go beyond just the contemporary, more contemporary hymns and songs that are in there. Um, but we really do want this to look uniform as a hymnal and to help people see these aren't, even though they might be different in some ways, they're still important to what we're doing in this hymnal. And we want them to be seen as part of the hymnal and not this just extra edition or something like that. Yeah. That's great that you have that included. Uh, what other, there, there are some other things that you've pulled back that you found even historical hymns that you've included in here maybe some charles wesley hymns that haven't been used i think there are some things yeah. like that tell us about some of those exciting new things that will be a part of this yeah there are goodness there are so many good charles wesley hymns that um have just been lost or forgotten um yeah. so there's one called let earth and heaven combine and so it's that real cosmic wow. sense of worship. Yeah. Like coming wow. together. I mean, it's kind of like the, the um, glory to God and, you know, the, the, uh, Oh, 4,000 talks is saying the verse glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given by earth, uh, the church below the church above, uh, by saints below and saints above the church and earth and heaven. It took me a minute to get there, but heaven and earth coming together, seeing worship as this coming of, of the church, um, in its fullest way. And so this Wesley hymn that really unpacks that well. And so, you know, a fantastic hymn there that um, we're excited about. Um, you know, the Salvation Army has one like that, Let uh, Earth and Heaven Agree. Um, I think it's more on prayer, isn't it? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. So kind of the same idea where, the, you know, this Wesley one's talking about in terms of worship, but you have a Salvation Army one um, in a very similar way. Um, there are... Um, let me think. Um, one of the things that we're doing in it is also including a metrical psalter, not a whole metrical psalter, but uh, we, you know, the Psalms were written to be sung. And yeah, so we great. have a handful, just a select few um, Psalms that Julie Tennant has put to rhyme and to meter that then are paired with familiar tunes. So you can sing the Psalms. You can awesome. actually sing the Psalms. We said, we really 
want to reclaim that. There's other things like, um, you know, alas, and did my savior bleed that we know, which usually now we know it as at the cross, you know, um, alas, and did my savior bleed and for dun, dun, yeah, yeah, dun, yeah, I got you. at yeah. the cross, at the cross, right? Yeah. So you have this chorus that's added to it, but that, you know, Watts didn't write the chorus. He just wrote the lyrics and wrote the verse. So he said, you know, one of the things we'd love to do with this hymnal is to show how hymns have developed and adapted over time. Um, and, um, and show different iterations of it, not all over the place, but every once in a while I'll do some. So he said, why don't we do at the cross, but then right next to it, let's put alas and did my savior bleed the original Isaac Watts version. So you can see here's how, I mean, so the verses aren't really going to change, but you can see here's how Watts wrote it and how it functioned before it had a chorus added to it. Now here's the version, you know, and love, and there's nothing wrong with singing it that way and doing that. But here's, you know, both iterations of this, both expressions of it. Um, and so really excited for that. Um, they're, uh, uh, trying to think of some others. Um, well, let me, let me stop you for a second. Yeah, please maybe go you ahead. Think about, um, yeah. I, I'm curious to thinking about maybe somebody's listening to this right now and they're a pastor and, and they're, they don't have a, maybe they have some volunteer musicians who help them out and just thinking of what they normally go through in picking songs and picking music. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who teaches worship, you're probably attuned to some of the things that people are doing and, and that might not be mistakes, but it's just like incredibly pragmatic. What do I need to get to sing this Sunday? How do I make this happen? And what are some of those mis not mistakes or, or things that could use more thought in our worship planning? Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like asking you that kind of as a worship professor side, like sure. in how you're, how you're training people to prepare worship on, on the, and then the second part of the question would be this, like, how can this hymnal help them? So there, there's yeah. one side, like there's, there's some problems with the way we go about worship in the church. Like maybe it's just like falling back to things. Okay. I know they know this song or they sang well mm -hmm. on this or go to CCLI or what's the most popular song or, mm -hmm. um, what, whatever it is, uh, what are some of those problem areas and how can this hymnal help yeah a couple of things that i think you're right that we just kind of fall back on the same yeah you know, there's uh i think ccli put this out but uh, i've seen it a few different places to say you know it's you can take a hymnal and most likely i mean it's going to be very unlikely that you get past 50 at best of the hymns you know people tend to just go back to the same wow. hymns over and over again yeah um i've actually heard i think ccli said here's the top 25 and we really don't see a whole lot of stretching outside of those, you know, maybe wow. some random things here and there, but the top 25 to 50 hymns um, just kind of keep going back to them. It's what we know. It's what people love. It's what they like. Uh, so I can get it from a very practical, pragmatic standpoint. Another part of it is um, we tend to just do kind of plug and play worship, you know? Um, so there's not a lot of conversation between maybe the pastor and the music leader, um, or there's not a lot of for planning, you know? Yeah. Um, so the, it, it's not, you know, I don't know the scriptures ahead of time, or I don't know the focus, or, I mean, maybe the conversation is not even happening at all, but even if it is, you know, it could be if the pastor is just coming up with a sermon yeah. a couple of days before that week or something, that didn't really help the musician and trying to plan songs and things like that. Sometimes the musicians don't even have a choice in it. Like the pastor just kind of picks them and they have to lead them. Um, so there's a lot of different things there um, that could be um, problems. Um, the, the plug and play is more like, okay, we have three songs at the beginning. We have one or two songs at the end and we just kind of put them in, you know, right. like we'll do what we know. We do what we like. Here's a new song I've been wanting to do or whatever. There's not a lot of intentional thought through it. So what I do to kind of correct that and to help people, and, and I'll relate this to the hymnal, um, is what I call the four S's of, okay. of worship planning, like song planning and, and worship. So um, the first one is the scripture. What is the scripture yeah. for the week? And so if somebody's doing the lectionary, you know, where, where there's that planned out um, for a year or for a few years, um, scripture sequence of readings and stuff and you're preaching off of those that have already been laid out and planned out for you you know i mean for traditions that do that or churches that do that you can go on the lectionary website and just see what's coming up at any point and start planning you know yeah oh, that's helpful that's nice um but if you don't do that to, it's just good to know ahead of time what is the scripture for this week and so if i'm doing music if i'm if i'm leading music in a church 
I am going to sit down myself and it'd be nice to have a conversation with the pastor here. Where are you going with this? How are you, what are you pulling out of it? What is it you really want to emphasize from this text? Be if I don't get that chance or, uh, or whatever, you know, even despite that, like, even if I did have that chance, I'm going to sit down with that scripture and I'm going to read through it a couple of times, or if it's multiple scriptures, I'm going to read through the scriptures a few times. And what are the major ideas that are coming out of this and praying with, you know, not just doing it, but like prayerfully read through it and think through it. God, what are you speaking here? What are some of the major things that I can see coming out of this? Um, and what songs now do I see that can relate to that? You know, so here's a song that I find that that is related to that idea or to that scripture in some way, maybe narrative, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it, there could be that. Um, so there might be narrative ones, uh, but yeah, think through the scripture. Um, and then of course you can always go to like hymnary.org, um, or to scriptural indexes in hymnals. So like right. what we'd have, you know, scriptural index, and then look up that scripture and there might be hymns already said like, oh, okay, well, there you go. That already is suggesting hymns. But if you don't know those hymns and can't do them, you know, it's still good for you to do that work of print. You know, I don't think we do that enough as musicians yes. um, and music leaders to actually sit with the scriptures for that Sunday and pray through them and think through them ourselves so that we are in that same kind of mental space as the right, pastor as right. she's preparing a sermon or she's preparing a sermon. Um, because um, there's, there's a chance that um, of course, you know, I might be kind of going here, but if we're really trying to lean on the Holy spirit, all we can trusting there's at least, going to be a foundation that we're both standing on in this scripture. So even if they're going a little bit off from where I'd go, there's the foundation still there and it's not totally unrelated. Um, it's right, still right, right. So scriptures first. Um, second is um, season. What season of the church are we in? So especially those that follow more liturgical seasons like Lent, Advent, Easter, Christmas. Um, but even very generally, you can still get that. Say like, okay, maybe you don't follow the Easter follow the liturgical calendar, the church calendar, but you could say right now we're close enough to Easter that Easter's still a good thing to sing about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we're in the season of Easter, but also it's only a few weeks out. So there's nothing wrong with that. So I say, you know, maybe it doesn't relate to the scripture totally, but I want to start off with a good Easter song just to kind of keep that celebration in front of us. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. this is a good resurrection song. And so for a hymn, though, you can just look up Easter songs or, you know, in the categories of the, you know, subject categories in the index. Excuse me. You can look up resurrection or look up Easter and find some good hymns or good songs that relate to Easter. Of course, the way that we have it laid out um, with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the resurrection of the dead, you know, so right. you can actually go to that and say, Oh, there you go. That's about resurrection. Or he rose from, you know, on the third day he rose again, look at that section and you've got it. So, yes. Yeah. So that could help for something like that, you know, so scripture season, um, and then structure, where are we in the structure of the service? Are we at the beginning of the service? Right. Are we at the end of the service? You know, you don't want to start. Um, I mean, you know, maybe somebody can make it work in a good way. But I wouldn't suggest the very first song off the bat being just as I am without one plea, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it could work. You know, you could make it work. I, I can see some ways. Um, but, you know, there's intentionality to that. Um, you know, I, you see that more as a response song. Right. Um, what's a good gathering song? What's a good thing that helps us focus on God and see God and know God's presence and character? You know, so, um, so scripture and then um, season and then setting, uh, st structure, sorry, structure, where are we in the structure of the service? Is this right before the sermon? Is this right before a scripture reading? Maybe you'd want to sing a song like Speak, O Lord, um, that talks about the scriptures, you know, a Getty hymn um, that talks about the scriptures being opened up and, and the spirit leading us and instilling within us the word of God. Um, Come Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire, you know, another one that could be good right before we're hearing a message or before we're going into prayer or something. Where are we in the structure of the service? And how does this song, not just a song that we sing and then just move to the next thing, how's it actually preparing us for what's about to come next? Sure. Um, so that's the third. So scripture and then um, season and then structure. And the last one's setting. And that setting is um, the, the context, the community, um, the culture that we're in. Um, so just to be aware and to, to know um, 
you know, if, if it's, if, if you're in a place that's used to more contemporary stuff, um, then maybe doing this second sent doing a lot of really old hymns is not going to be so i need to think through that did i just string together three songs that they're not going to know or that's in a right. genre or style that they're so unfamiliar with like they're not going to be able to participate well right. and so know my setting and say there's nothing wrong with pushing them there's nothing wrong with with stretching them beyond what they know but I need to be careful with how I do that and not give them worship whiplash, you know, and right. like to where they, yeah. So, so um, scripture and then season and then um, structure and then setting are the four S's yeah. that I'm thinking through um, constantly it. and like fingers on a hand. I don't do this as like one, then the next, then the next, then the next, yes, they're kind of yes. all there together and like fingers on a hand work together, you know, not just one at a time. Uh, yeah. But they all kind of work together at the same time. Um, and so, I mean, scripture is really the foundation of it all, but to say like all of this is working together, um, yes. like fingers on a hand rather than a systematic, like start here and then do this, then do this and do this, but kind of keep them all up there as you're planning and thinking about it. And the hymnal has those indexes that can help you, that can guide you. Um, it has the categories, the subjects. And so you can start thinking through those things um, uh, and, and have an aid there for suggestions. And, you know, sometimes even setting wise, it might be, Hey, this is a amazing text, but they do not know this hymn. This is a 16th century, right. You know, um, French tune that they've never heard. Oh, but you know what? We can sing that to this tune that they do know it's, you know, cause the, yes, the that's, thing. that's a metric yeah. index. I find, yes. I mean, you know, okay, so pe I don't know this one. Well, there's probably a tune that they yeah. people do know that you can help them find out. I, I used to get a little too creative with that when I was planning worship. Oh, <laughs> people yeah. got a little tired of singing yeah, the, the tunes I liked. So, uh, but you know, it's it's good. This is so good, Jonathan. I, I like. I'm excited about this. When will it come out? And how can they? How can people get it? So it will come out this fall. Is the is the projected release? Um, you know, barring any delays uh, for whatever reason, um, it should be sometime this fall. My uh, best guess, uh, especially from what I've been told by Seedbed, who is publishing it, is that it'll probably be September, probably late September, or early October um, would, would okay, be a great. pretty safe. Yeah, maybe before then, but I'd say that's a pretty safe uh, guess right now, um, projected um, release date. And you can get it through Seedbed. If you go on Seedbed's website, they'll have placeholders right now where you can express interest in it uh, for you or your church, if you'd right. like more than just one for yourself. Um, so, uh, so you can find it there and there will be bulk prices. So if you want to buy it for your church and say, well, we're going to need a hundred of these or 200, yes. of these, um, not just, you know, 10, um, then you can get bulk prices, um, and, but they'll be for sale individually also if you just want one for yourself, for your family, or to give as a gift. Um, but just keep um, keep an eye on seedbed.com. Right now, yeah. there is a site that you can go to. If, I think if you just Google even seedbed hymnal, you'll probably get the Asbury hymnal that pops up, but there's also a, right. a placeholder for this particular hymnal. By the way, I should name this. Uh, uh, the name of the hymnal is... Oh, yeah. Our, yeah. <laughs> Is our great redeemer's praise taken off of oh four thousand tongues to sing? Uh, the original was oh four thousand tongues to sing my dear redeemer's praise, and then it became my great redeemer's praise. Oh, and we interesting. Said, yeah, it is. Yeah, and we said to keep with the language that's more familiar, we want to keep the great redeemer's praise, but also we want to make it plural because it's not just about me and a personal thing. It's about the church, so we want to call it our great redeemer's praise. Oh, that's great. what we're calling it. So is uh. Here, here's here's a i'm sure this is a debated point is oh four thousand tongues to sing the number one song it is and that was not debated at all it, oh good yeah so uh for those that might not be familiar with this almost every iteration in the methodist tradition um every iteration of a hymnal has begun with the song oh four thousand tongues to sing which was written on the one year anniversary of charles wesley's own conversion heartwarming experience um and so uh, like the 1930, is it 32, 39? I can't remember, but that hymnal did not do it. And there's like one or two others that did not start with that. But every other Methodist hymnal has started with, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. And we said, there's no question we're doing the same. So wow. that will be the, that is number one in the hymnal. 
right? There, there's something to like putting that out there. And I love, I love the title of it too. And, and this is coming to at a great moment within the life of the Wesleyan movement, rather yeah. or not you're a part of it. Like you and I aren't a part of the United Methodist church right now, though we both have very close ties to it. Right. The global Methodist church is emerging this summer. We're recording this in early May. And yeah. so it's coming into existence. And not, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that everybody will throw out their United Methodist hymnals, but sure. at some point you will. And, and at yeah. that point, this would be a great hymnal to pick up. And yeah. I think like in other denominations and my tradition has, because of the inter inter use of words is often the way that we do it because we mm. want uh, all our, it's a global hymnal. The Salvation Army's hymnal is, um, people sing different tunes to different, uh, hymns. And so okay. because of that, we don't have any music, but I I'm one who's advocated for putting music in. It just helps people get on the same yeah. page and sing parts and, um, yeah. Anyway, it's generally a helpful process so that people can, even if you can't read music, actually, I find like my, my father-in-law, for instance, a Methodist minister for over 40 years, he says he doesn't read music, but he can look at a hymnal and he can sing the parts. I mean, he's just, he, yeah. he, he can, and yeah. you can really learn uh, just the ups and downs, or you can see black notes and you know, that yeah. goes faster. So I really encourage that, but in my tradition doesn't have music. So this would be a great one to pick up to yeah. have to be available. And I'm looking forward to it. And Jonathan, thank you. And I, I'm yeah, thank I you. Julie, Julie, 10, I know listens every now and then thanks to you and Julie for your hard work yeah. on this project. It means so much to us in this, in this kind of like world of the evangelical Wesleyan world to be able to have this resource. So we're really looking forward to it. One last yeah. question. I always ask yeah. people, Jonathan is, um, podcast is called more to story for theological reasons, but also kind of like the nature of what we're trying to do, get a deeper story. But is there more to the story of Jonathan powers? Like, is there something that you like to do or something that people don't often know about you? Yeah. Oh gosh. There's so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, so this is going to get really weird really quick. If that's okay. <laughs> um, talk about more to story. I am, um, I'm actually, very fascinated by ufos um ufo reports really yeah so talk about more to the story right and because and that's why because i find why are why do people like i get the report like i, I get a week I, i'm not a weekly i get a monthly newsletter that says how many sightings there have been in the in the nation and like by state and all of this and part of it's because I'm just fascinated, like, how are people trying to understand this world? And especially people that don't have a greater uh, narrative that yeah. they're part of. What are the narratives that we go to? Right? right. And I just find it fascinating. And that's the one I think someone's just growing up on the x file. Like, that was my favorite show. Absolutely favorite <laughs> show. Still love yeah, it. Sure. Still watch it all the time. Um, so growing up on that, there was, that, you know, this kind of narrative and the counter narratives that go out. And so I just, I, I'm just fascinated. Um, how do people try to make sense out of things that don't make sense? Where do they turn? Why do they turn to these things? Um, and I find it like the way that I kind of put it is I think that UFOs over the last, for our culture, UFOs over the last 60 years has kind of become modern day American folklore, mm. right? I mean, like we say other folklore and then we still have folklore, but it's kind of become this new iteration of folklore. And, um, and I'm just fascinated by it. I read the books on it. And then there's also just these government things that's like hard to explain. Like, why do they deny this? But then over here, they have this whole group that's dedicated to it. You know, <laughs> so like, that, like something's going on here. I don't think it's, you know, what yeah. these people are here claiming, but there's definitely something. And so that part of it kind of interests me, intrigues me. Like what's going on here with the government and why are they not saying this? But then there's this other narrative over here. What's the true narrative? Um, it's that whole X Files. The truth is out there. You know, I'm um, I, I'm bold enough to actually say that. Yes, there is truth, and it is out there. You know, yes, yes, <laughs> because sure. Christians, we believe that. So, um, so I know that. And but then there's this other way here to say this is just kind of a fascinating, fun thing to do to get into. And so, I hear the reports, I, I read the reports, I read books on it, and. I'm fascinated by why people come up with these theories and where they go with it. And so yeah. many times to think, what does that mean theologically? I have a, I have a book on my shelf up here called, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? So wow. 
you know, think about sacraments, you know, in, in, in some traditions and things, um, as they see baptism as a sacrament in this particular way, what does that mean if we were to actually discover alien life? So things like that, that become creative ways of thinking about theology too. Like yeah, what if this yeah. really was real? Um, but um, not like saying there's UFOs out there and we need to look at some stuff like that. It's just the narratives and then the creative oh, ways. That can help us. Yeah. And creative That's ways really, we start thinking about theology. Yeah. It's a deep answer. I like it because it's a, I had, I had a neighbor and I, he occasionally listens to the podcast. Uh, he might Larry and uh, he would, uh, he, he wasn't a Christian, didn't believe in God, but he did believe in ghost. Okay. And, and he was a ghost hunter. He would go around the state All right, and yeah. find like, uh, hotbeds for ghost activity. And so to me, I felt like that was like, you, you're, you believe in something non-physical yes. in like, so let's, let's, let's work through that. You know, I, I wish you could say it crossed the goalpost for them. Right, uh, yeah. But it, but nevertheless, like, I think there's something to that. Now I, here's my UFO story. You, uh, you, you and I were it. in the same yeah. place. We were both oh. at Asbury university and I have somebody with me coming back from center college. I saw this big circular green thing go over it. And, and I looked at Jeff Barrington, who teaches at Asbury oh, University. And yeah. I said, did you see that? And we both said, we can't deny it. Now he might deny me now, but nice. there's, I don't know what it was, but certainly there are unidentified flying yes. objects. Yes. There's no doubt about that. That's a reality. Yeah. <laughs> But where do they come from is the question. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, right. there are unidentified. And that's some of it, too, is to see, like, where the government, you know, some of the stuff was happening in the 50s and 60s, government testing. Of course, you didn't want people to know about it because you didn't want to get out there to other nations that we're at war with. And, you know, like, so there's some hidden. I mean, that makes sense. There's other things, though. I mean, it really is like, I don't know. Like, it's hard to explain. We don't know what to do with it. And. How do we begin thinking? But I love going to that place. What does it mean theologically if we really start unpacking this and thinking yes, about yes, it? Yes, yes, um, Can we accept some of this in light of our Christian views and our theology? Is there some things that have to be rejected? Um, how would we, what, what does it, where does it push us to, to think about, you know, like I said, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Um, would you? Um, there's, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> are they sentient you know yeah, um, not yeah, just sure. uh what kind of uh, creature is it um yeah and uh what um uh, how would they continue to be in the church and this is why the savage army doesn't practice the sacraments because it's all aliens question. just because it, of that question just because of that question <laughs> yeah that's really funny actually <laughs> but it's i don't know it's fascinating and i, and I do find again like you were saying your, your friend who's a ghost hunter i think that modernity disenchanted us to such a degree yes. that we're longing for it like we turn to all kinds of places to be enchanted again and it's interesting to see where we'll actually go and where we'll suspend belief um i mean not in a bad way actually in a good way that we'll actually suspend belief based on nothing but empirical evidence you know yeah to say there's got to be more than just what we can see and prove by science that uh that is real um and so um those those open doorways and those gateways to say okay this is you know this is great this is fascinating and how do we how do we kind of think about this more so again this is great yeah. it's the longest answer i've ever had to this question and wow. the, maybe the best now there've been All some right. good ones uh, <laughs> some people are really thrown off by it but uh i never had somebody run with it like that into but i love <laughs> All right. so you have your cool. ufo questions send them to dr johnson powers right. at asbury <laughs> university asbury seminary yeah, right yeah <laughs> jonathan it's been oh. great to have you on here and we'll uh post links when the time comes to share awesome the we're really thankful for your work here uh, and thanks for coming on the podcast thanks everybody for joining thank us. you thank you for having me